Good evening and welcome to For the People and the second part of our conversation with Dr. Donna M. Richards, author of Urugu, an African-centered critique of European cultural thought and behavior. In this segment, Dr. Richards discusses, among other things, the role the Greek philosopher Plato played in creating the European way of thinking and behaving. But first, we begin with this question. As you say, other cultures have exhibited aggression, Im imperialistic uh, tendencies. What accounts for Europe's success? I'm glad you got to that question. Mm -hmm. uh, because what it allows me to do, I think, is to get at uh, what I think is the specialness of the approach, the method that I used um, in, in this study. Um, so it's going to take me a little mm -hmm. while, if, if, if that's okay. Um, I said to myself that, um, and this definitely was with the help of the ancestors, I want to, you know, uh, affirm that, by the way, that it was not... Why, why is that important? That's important because of our concept of connectedness our concept of the universe, that it's not just words to talk of a spiritual universe and our spirituality as a people, but we've got to understand um, where our energy comes from. And I know that that's where mine came from. Um, so this is ours. Uh, this, this belongs to us. I had to say, how would I approach studying the European given African conceptions. You see, it's one thing to say, okay, I want to do this, but then use their conceptions. What does it mean for us to really think in African terms? And so what I did was to uh, develop um, concepts that came from an African worldview, not a European worldview. And I came up with the concept of a silly. I also used um, African and African language. That's a, uh, a Kiswahili word that means seed, origin, the essence of something. The reason that was important was um, because what people would say is, and they will say, oh, Europe is so vast. It is, um, uh, there are so many different kinds of, of European uh, uh, forms and different countries. How can you talk about Europe as a whole? Now, of course, they've been talking about Europe as a whole all of this time, but when we uh, begin to look at them, suddenly it's going to be, no, you can't really do this because it's too diverse. Mm -hmm. I needed a concept which um, could explain a culture in terms of its core in terms of its ideological core so that you could look at every different aspect of the culture and see how it fit into this one seed or core. And that's why I used the asili. And the idea of the seed was that once that asili is in place, that cultural asili, that it will seek to fulfill itself. So the way in which the culture will develop will all be feeding into that asili. Mm -hmm. And that would help me to get at consistency in terms of European development. What throws us as a people is that we make exceptions. You know, we say, oh, well, that's different over here, and that's different. This is a good one over here, and this doesn't really work that way. But in my analysis, it's all consistent. And it's all working for one purpose. And the concept of Vasili helped me to see that. And that is, that comes to the answer to your question, is that uh, what I was able to do was to see that the nature of the European Vasili was to seek power. That it, uh, in essence, is, uh, we could almost say it is an Vasili which lacks wholeness and therefore must must always see. Go back to Urugu now. Remember Urugu as the incomplete being that is always, always must be seeking but can never be fulfilled because he can't get the, the, the complementary part of himself. Their Asili, the Asili, the European cultural Asili is incomplete 
must always be um, uh, seeking. Now, it, it cannot be fulfilled through spirit because they have no knowledge of spirit, no relationship to, to spiritual reality. Therefore, fulfillment is sought through power. And power here means power over other. And what that means is that everything within the culture, all of the development of European culture, all of the forms, all of the institutions, the ideas even, are all for the purpose of achieving European power. Now, your question was, if we can um, recognize that there have been um, imperialistic behaviors in other cultures, then what is the difference uh, between European culture and these other cultures? And the answer is that Europeans have been most successful at achieving um, world domination because everything within the culture supports the quest for domination everything everything mm -hmm. including and most importantly to me their philosophical concepts including their concept of truth including their um academies, academia, the intellectuals, including that. It works for, including um, Christianity as it manifests itself, um, you know, within the mm -hmm. Euro European development. All of that works for the achievement of European power. Okay, okay. What would you say are the main features of African cultural thought and behavior that separate it from European okay. cultural thought and behavior? I think that um, that's a good question because even to understand the nature of European culture um, and how it works, what we need to begin with is the African worldview and how it works. That provides a frame of reference that you mm -hmm. can then use. Um, the African concept of the universe is as a, as a spiritual whole where everything is interrelated. That means that uh, what is emphasized is, is not only spirit, but connectedness. And that we um, conceive of ourselves, we experience ourselves, I should say, as spiritual beings, um, that as almost as cosmic beings, and by that I mean that we are connected to, uh, to nature, to the forces of nature, uh, to each other uh, in such a way that that's where we get definition and that's where we get strength. And so power for us becomes energy, the energy to do, to make things happen. We uh, energize each other. Interaction becomes important. Complementarity becomes important. The relationship between spirit and matter is one in which they are connected, where material reality is understood as just the way spirit manifests itself, that simply. On the other hand, in the European worldview and way of thinking, the way of looking at the universe, human beings become separate and distinct individuals. The only way that you can know anything about the universe is to separate yourself from it, to take connectedness out of it, and thereby create what they call the object. That's all that you can know. Now, this, this object is a thing mm -hmm. that has uh, no, no, uh, no feeling, no meaning, no spirit, okay? That's, a create, that's an illusion in their minds. But it works for them, because if they, what, what Plato did, if we can go back to Plato, okay. is that if he could get people to uh, agree that this was the only truth, then what he could do is say that, well, the people who were closest to that truth, those are the people who should rule all the other people. Mm -hmm. So that worked within their culture. It gave him the basis for a hierarchy within Europe. Now explain to me this creation of the object thing. I'm not, not clear on that. Okay, what you do is, um, if you can 
as a human being, first separate, make a split in yourself and say, there's part of me that thinks and there's part of me that feels. Now, in reality, that doesn't happen. You're a whole person. At least that's the African conception. Uh -huh. But in his conception, that's what he said. That's what Plato said. Then what you say is, there's a part of me that's better than the other part of me. This thinking part is better than this other part. Okay? Then you say that the better part needs to either control or do away with that lesser part. Mm -hmm. So you got this thinking being. This emotional part or what? The thinking part is getting rid of the emotional part. Right. Uh -huh. Okay? Uh -huh. Trying to control that. And so then what he says is, that's the only way that you can have knowledge. Okay? So here you, if you have somebody who is feeling, who is dealing with feelings, okay, um, or he, who is defined in that way, then they're the lesser person, they're the bad person, and they should be controlled by the person who is just doing this thought thing, mm -hmm. you see, that they've constructed, all right? So within the state that he constructed, the republic, then he was able to say, uh, base it all on this concept of the object, to say that these better people who could, who could understand the object, who were not spiritually into things, mm -hmm. they were the people who should control things. Well, look what happens then when you get nations relating to each other or cultures relating to each other. You say, the culture that accepts this um, objective way of looking at truth, that's the creation of the object, that culture should dominate, control those that don't have that concept. They can should control the more spiritual cultures because they're the ones that are more civilized, more scientific, more rational, and all of mm -hmm. those things. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to push you on this. This is a very okay. difficult, it this is. is a very difficult topic. Right. I'm going to push you because we want to make sure that first of all I understand, and secondly that everybody <laughs> in the viewing audience okay. can understand the creation of this object. object. Can I push okay. you? this object? I'm, I'm I'm still trying to get at that. Okay. Um, it's, it's always better for me to go back to our experience, okay? Mm -hmm. For us, what I call uh, a phenomenal universe is important. And to break that down, all we mean is that experience is important. The way we experience things is important in our knowing, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. Go back to the European conception, the creation of the object. You take out experience. There should be no experience in there at all. There should be no connection. Okay? Another thing. For us, we learn through our involvement in the universe, in life. That, again, is experience. Go to the creation of the object. The way the object is created is by detaching the self from everything. The object is what? The object is the thing that is left when you detach yourself from the universe. All right. Remember, Say that again. Say that again. the object is what is left, and it's a thing. <laughs> uh -huh. When you detach yourself from the universe. Okay. Think about Descartes saying, I think, therefore I am. Meaning that there's nothing else that is important about a human being except this ability to somehow do this thing of rational thinking on this object. That's all that makes you a human being. That's what makes you important. For us, you can't separate thought and emotion. They're part of, they, they're thought and feeling are necessarily linked and from that, we get intuitive knowledge, which is very important for African what people. What do the two do for each other? The emotional part and the, and the quote, rational. I think what they give is, they, they give us, uh, for one thing, intuitive understanding of things. Mm -hmm. That is, for African people, like the, the ancients used to say, know thyself. What they meant by that is, we are like a microcosm of the universe. The universe exists in us. That's an African belief, okay? Mm -hmm. Therefore, if that's true, 
then by studying yourself, by knowing yourself, you come to know the universe. By coming to know the universe, you're coming to know yourself. That's why they said know thyself, okay? Mm -hmm. If we accept the European concept, then you're left with a self with no uh, relationship to the universe, no um, uh, emotional involvement in the universe. It is detached, okay? Um, but that was necessary to create that object. The important thing about the object was that it could be controlled. That's what Plato was getting at, and that's what has been accepted since his time. That in order to know, in order to be able to have knowledge, you had to be independent. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what the separateness did for you. Mm -hmm. And that's what the lack of feeling did for you. It gave you control over something. What you control is the object. So we come back to the object. Now, if you look in terms of people and cultures, we become the object. Okay. You see, okay. that can be controlled, that can be acted on in any way necessary or possible. What do you do when you go into a scientific laboratory? You have these things that you can manipulate and do whatever you want with. That's the same way in which African people are treated, are related to by Europeans as objects that can be manipulated in whatever way has to be manipulated. Now, what we do is we feed into that by accepting their definitions of reality. Or we would understand, we're not objects. Hey, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? That there is a spiritual reality that connects us to the universe and so forth and so on. You, you've already touched on this, but um, um, what do you mean by a spiritual, spiritual universe? And what kind of universe did um, okay. Plato... We're going to be talking about him a lot, I see. Oh, uh, boy. <laughs> By a spiritual uh, universe. We, we mean um, a u universe that is fundamentally spiritual in nature. That means that spirit is the fundamental reality. That, that means that there is a level of reality that gives meaning to everything else in the universe that that's the it's, it's like a foundation it gives meaning to everything else and it connects everything else see that's why rhythm by the way is so important to us as a people because it's that which connects things we believe in connectedness we look for relationships for interrelationships again what plato did was the, what i believe is that that connectedness that rhythm in the universe is difficult for the European to understand because they function on a level of um, surface, a surface level, a literal level, not a multi-dimensional level with depth. And when you start talking about spirit, you're talking about uh, multi-dimensionality, multi-levels that gets deeper and deeper and deeper. When you talk about the object, what you're doing is that's just a very surface um, kind of reality. In all African systems, there are levels that you go to as you grow. In fact, life, uh, a human life, is the development through stages of existence where you, you're learning more and more and more. Mm -hmm. you know, about yourself and the universe. So among the Dogon people, if I can go back to them, they have a level, the, the simplest level is called Jiri So. G-I-R-I, -I, then S-O. And it uh, translates um, word at face value. For them, that is the most superficial level of learning. Mm -hmm. And they move from there to um, what they call word from the side, then word from behind, then clear word. So you're getting to deeper, uh, you're, getting, you're gaining perspective, you see, you're, you're, you're getting textures of, of, of truth. Mm -hmm. You go to the object, you go to Plato's concept, and what you have is a very simplistic way of looking at reality that necessarily disconnects everything. It compartmentalizes, it separates Go back to your question about what is the spiritual universe. The spiritual universe, that concept tells us that you cannot separate things.
that there is some level on which everything is interconnected. Okay? That's one thing it means. It also means that um, we are focused on meaning. Not just what something appears to be, but what does it mean? How is it a, a, a symbol of a, of a deeper sacred truth? That's what it means to think in terms of a spiritual universe. That's how we think as, as African beings. So it's powerful, but it's also um, difficult mm -hmm. if, if, you, if it's not your nature. Mm -hmm. It may be impossible if it's not your nature. You see, so if, if um, what, what Plato was doing, and we really need to get beyond this because it's, 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 it's larger than, than Plato. Okay. Okay. Uh, but what he was doing was he came along at a time in European development where um, in order to solidify and to concretize and to, and to further develop the definition of what it meant to be European, he used um, thought. He said, if I can get people to agree to a certain way of, of thinking, um, then it can help to uh, uh, define who's going to be in charge of this hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? And if you're dealing with a people who, remember what, what um, uh, the, the Africans said about the Greeks? What did they say? They said, you Greeks are but children. What did they mean? They meant that they could only um, approach reality on a, on, that, on a surface level, that they couldn't understand the depth of the symbolism that was involved in African culture and in comedic uh, civilization. So now, if he could get people to accept a definition of truth, which was simple in this way, you see, which did cut out the spirit, the rhythm, the connectedness, and so forth, then what he could do was to indeed infer, affirm who he was. Mm. That's what they did. They defined truth in such a way that it, um, that it affirmed them it was indeed in their image. Now you say that his work was not very influential, um, during the time that he lived, uh, how did it become so influential? Okay, when, it, when I say that it wasn't um, very influential, I mean that he was still fighting a, a battle, mm -hmm. that there were still other views, okay. and it was not uh, popular, mm -hmm. you know, at that time. But he had vision. That's what I believe, that he was definitely not a, uh, a philosopher with his head in the clouds, uh, as Aristophanes said about the making, poking fun at the philosophers of the time, that he had a model, had a plan, and had a vision. So that what happens is you, uh, the academy he puts in place, the academy becomes the institution which supports this concept of truth, which in turn supports the structure of the state that he's trying to build. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. Which includes slavery and everything else. Um, after him, then you get um, these conceptions being developed by later, uh, subsequent philosophers. Um, even Aristotle, who is, um, you know, when you learn in school, he is uh, contrasted with Plato, like, like his one big difference between Aristotle and Plato. From our point of view, in terms of cultural realities, in terms of the European Asili, they're like extensions of each other. Mm. He's just a continuance of that and, and, and put focus in a, in a different area, further developed it, but has the same Asili. Then you come to the Neoplatonists. You come to uh, even Augustine. I'm showing how Augustine's uh, 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 relationship to Platonic thought. And then you have, once you have the academy in, in place, and people should understand what I mean by the academy, that is where um, uh, your scholars, you know, come out of. That is the basis for all of the educational system that we have and, and so forth. Um, once that's in play, it begins to grow and grow and grow and to the point that what we have now is you don't have to argue for a particular concept of truth in the school, say, here in America. Mm -hmm. It is assumed the things that Plato was arguing for then. He had to argue, for instance, for the 
uh, dominance of the written or, or, or literate modality over the all. What had been the uh, tradition was uh, uh, the reciting of, of uh, um, oral um, uh, epics and, 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 and stories and so forth that everybody could get involved in. And there was a lot of emotional involvement and so forth. Um, what Plato saw in that was he couldn't control that. It was a lack of control. There's too much participation, mm -hmm. you see, from large numbers of people. But in terms of how they used writing, it becomes a mechanism for control. It's lineal in thinking, non-circular. The, 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 it, the lineal is less spiritual, you see? Mm -hmm. it, it's more secular, and it becomes something where once you write down the, the word, then that word becomes oppressive. What do you mean then? writing. What do you mean then? It's like, uh, you know, we do that now. Um, we'll say, oh, um, it's in a book. I had a teacher once said to me that um, as missionaries went into Africa and other areas, Catholic missionaries, that they didn't have a problem converting us because they had a superior religion and the way that people knew that it was superior was because there was this book. That it was it was in writing and it was something that they could point to in writing so that what what Plato was setting up was that you could use uh, the written word to intimidate people and have them feel that something was truer because mm -hmm. it was in writing